Come with me to Acts chapter 3, verse 1 here. <clears throat> One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. And so the man gave them his attention, expecting to, to get something from them. And Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk, and then he went with them, with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him <clears throat> walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I was reading an article online the other day, I think it was about fixing a bike thing, and the article started with this line, and I thought it was, it was pretty fitting. He said, I'm convinced that after the apocalypse, we can learn to rebuild the world if we can just get the YouTube servers back online. <laughs> Think about that. <clears throat> He's saying, we live in a time where there's nothing you can't figure out or fix because you have YouTube and you YouTube how to do blank. How many of you have done this for something? Yeah, probably most of you. I learned how to tile from lay tile from watching YouTube. It wasn't great, but I got the job done. Uh, I learned how to swaddle my sons when they were little. I can remember them being on the changing table trying to hold them down and I'm watching a YouTube video while trying to fold those things in. It's hard to swaddle, it's not easy. Um, I mean, I can think of all, all kinds of things that I've I've youtube how to do my kids they have a limited amount of time they can play video games each week and inevitably when they're playing video games i hear dad will you youtube how to beat this level so they're cheating their way through video games <laughs> like if it wasn't already bad enough on their brains they're just cheating their whole way uh through the video games we have this toilet in our house that hasn't worked for a while and so um i've googled or youtube sorry about 20 different videos about how to change a toilet now, I haven't changed it yet. Uh, I just put a sign on the door that said, out of order. So if anybody comes, but uh, I may watch another video about it this afternoon and think about, think about doing that. We live in a time where pretty much anything we think can be fixed. And what that does for us is it creates an illusion of fixability. That everything should be as simply fixed as it is in a 10 minute or better, a five minute YouTube video. Right. And yet you and I, if you're like me, I'm guessing you are, you probably have things in your life that have gone unfixed for a very long time. Very long time. And so at some point, like me, that thing that was so raw and difficult and tough that went unfixed for so long, instead of dealing with it, you shut the door and you put out of order on there. That's kind of the part of the home, your interior home, that you don't visit and you hope nobody else does. It's the thing that just feels like it can't get fixed. And so I bring that up because right now we are in the Christian season of Advent. You ever heard that term before? Advent. It's a word that means arrival or coming, the one who's, who's coming to us. And traditionally, the Advent season is the season from about Thanksgiving leading up to Christmas. 
where we are anticipating or waiting on the arrival of Jesus, which we celebrate at Christmas. And really, you're supposed to do two things at Advent. First, you're supposed to put yourself in the shoes of those people of God long before Jesus came, who waited for generations, centuries, for the coming of the promised king, and waited with hope, anticipation, and sometimes desperation. So you're supposed to put yourself in their shoes, and you're supposed to feel that feeling. And then secondly, you are supposed to feel what it's like to wait for and long for and desire more than anything in the world for Jesus to come back, the second coming. So again, Advent is about you feeling a feeling. I want the Lord to come back more than I want anything else in the world. But to feel that feeling, that need, that you need Jesus to come back, begins with recognizing something that's wrong and unfixed in your life. Or else, you don't need Jesus. Uh, I grew up reading these books by this guy named Gary Paulson. He, he writes books for young boys. He wrote Hatchet. Did any of you read Hatchet growing up? Yeah. It's about this kid who is stranded in the Canadian wilderness, uh, struggling to survive all by himself. He goes down in a plane crash, and he lives. So he's, he's in the wilderness all by himself, desperate, struggling to survive. And he hears at one point this distant ru- uh, hum of a bush plane flying over, maybe looking for him. And so he's filled with so much joy and excitement because this is his rescue coming. And he runs to the top of this giant cliff and he begins to build this fire, this signal fire, and tries to put it together before the plane leaves. And I think about that in comparison to you and I. How many times a day does an airplane fly over our head and we don't even notice it? You know, what's the difference? Need. And an awareness of how desperately you need help. So an awareness of your need inclines you to long for the one and maybe the only one who can meet the need. Are you with me? Are you tracking with me? Okay. So come back with me to Acts chapter 3 here. Acts chapter 3 is about that need. The things in our lives that have gone unfixed, maybe our whole lives, like this man's condition, lame from birth. Uh, Tish Harrison Warren, she talks about Advent. She says, to practice Advent is to lean into an almost cosmic ache, our deep and wordless desire for things to be made right and the incompleteness we find in the meantime. Okay, that's Acts 3. Things are not right for this young man. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come at this story from two different angles this morning. And I'm going to hope that one of those angles is what you need to hear this morning. My guess is that both of them may not be, but what I'm hoping is that one of them will be. So let's enter the story. And this kind of a, this is a tool for those of you reading your Bible on yourself. You pick a character in the story and you imagine the story through their eyes. So let's start with Peter and John, who are going to represent the church. They're going to represent us. And then we're going to go to the man himself who's healed. So let's start with Peter and, and John. Look with me at Acts chapter 3. If you've got your Bible open, you'll see this. If you're looking at it on a device, you go back one page to Acts chapter 2, or you scroll up a little bit, look up, sorry, in your Bible, or flip back a page. Acts chapter 3, verse 1, comes right after this passage at the end of Acts 2 we've been talking about for weeks, where the early church was all together. They had everything in common. They spent their time praising God, eating good food. Everybody in the city, everybody around them just loved them. They shared everything that they had. I mean, it was Christian utopia at the beginning. And Peter and John, so Acts chapter 3, verse 1, step out of Christian utopia, their experience with the body of Christ where everything is magical and perfect at the beginning. They step out of that, and what is the first thing they encounter? Brokenness. Somebody for whom everything is not perfect. Somebody who has a deep need that has gone unfixed their whole life. Somebody who's begging for help, 
right outside the temple. They step out of everything perfect and they walk into difficulty and brokenness. Think about that. Uh, Lindsay and I, I, I've shared before, we worked for this little church outside of Abilene, the Cottonwood Church of Christ, for three years before we came here. I've shared Cottonwood stories from time to time. I've told you on a good Sunday, we had about 12 people. They were the best 12 people, the best 12 people. We would, we would spend a couple hours together on Sunday morning just reading God's Word together and talking about our ailments and um, did you rub Ben Gay on that or whatever it is, you know, those kind of conversations we had. And we would have potluck together and uh, after service, and we would go and we would eat potluck, but Miss Susie, you didn't eat what Miss Susie brought, but everything else was safe. You know what I'm talking about at potluck? We would just encourage each other, just good old country folks out there in Cottonwood. And then we would leave there just kind of filled with the spirit and delight. And we would drive back 45 minutes to Abilene. And Lindsay and I, when we were newly married, we lived in this garage apartment in an alleyway in Abilene. I think it was 400 a month, utilities included, as what we could afford. And it was a stretch for us. It was a stretch goal. And uh, because we lived in an alleyway where the rent was like that and less and some of those other garage apartments, the alleyway attracted the kind of people who couldn't afford much for rent. And so the woman who lived next to us, single woman who lived next to us, Miss Shirley, she was in her 50s, actually looked much older. She had had a very hard life, uh, constant battles with drugs and addiction, a string of men in her life that had abused her, misused her, treated her terribly. In fact, we saw a string of them come through that little house and live with her for a time. And then she would come over broken and battered. Really tough times. I can't remember how many times, but I have the vision just seared into my memory. We would be driving back from Cottonwood where everything was perfect, it seemed. And we would pull up to our little garage apartment and there would be Miss Shirley just sobbing on our steps. And Lindsay would get out and go put her arm around Miss Shirley and we were back into life. You know what I'm talking about? And look here again with me, Peter and John. Here you got these two guys. They're stepping out of everything great. And and we know the church can't be that way all the time. But at that moment, they're getting all that they could possibly get from the body of Christ. They're enriched and encouraged by this, and they step out of that. And the first thing they step into is the brokenness and despair of someone outside this circle. And they don't run. You know, they don't say, oh, do you think he saw us? Don't make eye contact. What does it say? They looked straight at him, and they told him to look at them. Look at that. And then you got this guy, and he's asking for money. Did you notice that? He's not asking, actually, to be helped with his deep need. What he's asking for is a way to get by money. That's what he's asking for. And Peter and John say they don't have that money. They don't have that to give him. But what they do have is faith in the name of Jesus Christ, and so they speak that over him. And because of that, the man's life is radically transformed and he's healed. And I've thought about that. I mean, so many times you and I read these great stories and we're going to read a lot more of them in Acts. And we think, man, I wish I had the kind of power that those apostles had to actually help and heal people. Well, look with me here. This is Acts chapter 3, verse 16. It's a few verses later. Peter is explaining how this man was healed And this is what he says. He says, By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It's Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. Just look at that for a second. He says what healed this man was two things. Faith in the name of Jesus. And those two things are two things you and I still have. You and I still have. And so here's this guy asking Peter and John for something, and they don't have what he needs but or what he wants. They do have what he needs. I mean, think about that. How many times have you 
gone into the world and confronted brokenness and you're being asked for something and you don't have what they need. You don't think you can fix them, but what if, in fact, you have the only thing that can meet their needs, and that is faith in the name of Jesus? What if you're the only one who actually has what they need and can speak it over them? Hmm. You may notice that the man, he goes from sitting outside the temple. Did you see that? And did you see where he goes after he's healed? He jumps up with them and runs into the temple, jumping around, walking and praising God. You see that? He's ecstatic. And he's moved from outside the people of God to inside, to worshiping God with them. That's what happens. Because in faith, they spoke the name of Jesus over this man. All right. Let's, take, uh, let's look at this story in the other way, though. Let's, let's look at it from that man's perspective himself. And maybe some of you needed to hear that. You got somebody in your life who's struggling. They've got some unmet need. You feel inadequate to meet their need. But you do have faith in the name of Jesus. You may not be as inadequate as you think. But let's look at it at the, from the perspective of this lame man. All right. He's sitting at the gate called Beautiful begging for money. All right. We don't know exactly which gate the gate called Beautiful was. We do know a lot about the ancient temple. And one thing we know was that there was a gate that was reserved for wealthy people. I'm not saying that's the way it should be. That's the way it was. And the gate that was reserved for wealthy people was, like you would expect, ornate. Real, a uh, good-looking gate, as gates go, okay? So we think he might have been sitting at that gate, which makes sense if you're begging for money, that you would go to the gate where who are coming in? Wealthy people. So this guy, he's, he's no slouch. He's a businessman. He's positioned himself, or gotten help to be positioned, in the place where he's most likely to get the money he's asking for. Now, think with me through this for a second. He needs more than anything in his life to be healed in the name of Jesus and to be filled by faith. That's what Peter says about him. But what's he settling for? Money and stuff. Do you see that? That's what he's settling for. Money and stuff. Ah, Okay, now we're ready to talk about Advent and Christmas. So at Advent, the season leading up to Christmas, I'm supposed to feel my deep unmet needs and the deep unmet needs of the world, unfixed problems of the world, so that I long for the only one who can meet those needs and fix those problems. I'm supposed to feel that feeling leading all the way up to Christmas, and I get to Christmas Day, and I settle for new socks or a gift card to Home Depot to buy that toilet. You know, like what a window this is into the human condition that we are designed by God to long for him more than anything else and to not be satisfied by anything but his son, Jesus Christ. And even in this Advent to Christmas season, we are conditioned to be satisfied with gifts, stuff, and money. I mean, think about that. I'm not the Scrooge. I love Christmas. We're going to give great Christmas presents. We're going to share in the joy of that, watch Hallmark movies and all that stuff. But just think about that conditioning that you and I are supposed to long for as the people of God more than anything else, his son, Jesus, and we settle for making more money and buying more stuff to mask and bury that unmet, unfixed need. And we can only do that when we close the door, put out of order on it, and focus on everything else. So here's, here's what I want you to think about, if that's you. Over the next few weeks, as we head up to Christmas, and Christmas is going to be incredible, okay? But I want you to, to really fully enter into this, this time of Advent by asking yourself one question. Why do I need Jesus? So so what is it about me that's unfixed, that's closed behind the doors, that's broken? Why 
Not why does like my friend out there who's got all these problems, he really needs Jesus. Or my spouse who's got these issues, they need Jesus. Or my kids, oh my goodness, you know. No, but what about you? What is it about you? Why do I need Jesus more than anything else? A.W. Tozer, he said this, and I'll leave you with this quote. He said, in this hour of all but universal darkness, one cheering gleam appears. Within the fold of Christianity, there are to be found increasing numbers of people whose religious lives are marked by a growing hunger after God himself. They're eager for spiritual realities, and they won't be put off with words, and they won't be content with correct interpretations of truth. They are a thirst for God, and they won't be satisfied till they have drunk deep at the fountain of living water. And this, he says, is the only real harbinger of revival which I have been able to detect anywhere on the religious horizon. It can result in a resurrection of life for many souls and a recapture of that radiant wonder which should accompany faith in Christ, but that wonder which has sadly fled most in the church of God today. Don't let that be true of us, Lord. May we be people who long for Jesus Christ more than the air we breathe, more than the food we eat. God, we desire you more than anything else. Send your son, Jesus. Let me pray over you. God, like the man in this story, each of us have pieces of our life that are unfixed. God, would you make those clear to us? Would you show those to us? Because our desire, God, is in seeing our need clearly that we will see our need for your son clearly. And that as a church, and as individuals, we would be consumed by a desire for more of your son, Jesus. Fill us, God, with him and his grace. And I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.